Hey, everybody. Welcome to Daniel Davis Deep Dive coming to you live from Washington, D.C. Uh, and we have one of our favorite guests on this show today with us, Matthew Ho, former State Department official, former combat Marine and really just all around good guy. Welcome back to the show, Matt. I ho hope you had a good Christmas. Thanks, Danny. I hope the same for you and your family as well. Well, uh, you know, I, I wish we could just spend the, the next hour just talking about, you know, what you did for Christmas, what you got, was it, did, did it fit, you know, what, what, how, how much fun did you have with family and all that? But uh, unfortunately, we got some, some other issues to, to discuss here that take a little bit of priority, though I still want to get back and talk to you about those things. Uh, the, we're going we're gonna to just jump right in here to uh, the situation in, in Ukraine. Now, especially with all this, uh, you know, explosive things going on in the uh, Israel-Hamas war, that's kind of taken a lot of the space up in the oxygen for headlines these days. But the, the war in Ukraine is still grinding on. And there have been some developments of late, uh, just even over the last few days that I want to talk a little bit more about and get some insight to you on what you think some of the ramifications of this are going to be. There, there has been so quietly talked about the, the level of Ukrainian casualties that they have suffered. Uh, from the start of this war. Now, most people in the West, anyway, always like to kind of keep that on the down low and or or even like some of the official U.S. and, and U.K. government release figures have, you know, intelligence has told us that the numbers are really, you know, remarkably low. Uh, I remember in the in the low double digit thousands uh, just a few months back, I, I saw that, you know, regrettably the numbers of this, but whatever. Uh, never quite washed, but now then we have some indirect information that the numbers are staggeringly high. Uh, and, and that came from the actual commander of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, uh, General Valery Zeluzhny. Now, what we have is, uh, I say indirect, because there has been a lot of rumors that actually Zelensky, uh, about a week or so ago, said that he wants to mobilize an additional 500,000 troops. Now, they had somewhere north of 750,000 in probably by April or May of 2022. And of course, they've been in almost nonstop mobilizing since. Now, all of a sudden, after this summer uh, offensive that they had, they're going to now ask for an additional half million troops. So what that tells you is that they have they can't go on the offensive anywhere because they, they have a shortage of literally every category of things you can imagine. But now that at half a million, that tells you that the casualties are probably close to that figure already and possibly even more. So first of all, let me show you what Zeluzhny himself said, uh, I believe just yesterday. І таке інше військове командування продовжує виконувати функцію захисту своєї держави, відповідно, формує свої запити, запити на боєприпаси, на зброю і, відповідно, на людський ресурс. Ці цифри, ми цю цифру сформували, ми цю цифру сформували, відповідно, формували і на наступний рік. Вона, звісно, враховує покриття поточеного накомплекту, який виник. Формування нових військових частин, а також прогнозування наших втрат, які можемо ми понести на протязі наступного року. Okay, now, just so people are aware, kind of behind the scenes, there's a little bit of tweaking going on. You may have seen in the Economist a month or so ago that Zeluzhny came out and, and honestly admitted that the summer offensive did not succeed, that they were in a stalemate and they wanted to do some other things. That opened a, an open feud between Zeluzhny and Zelensky where he was saying one thing and Zeluzhny was another. They have been butting heads trying to see who's, whose fault the, uh, you know, the failure was, both trying to go the other way. Apparently, Zelensky's afraid that Zeluzhny may resign and, and run for president in 2024 against him and just lots of intrigue going on there. And so that's Zeluzhny was saying, oh, well, I didn't, we didn't give a specific number, even though the president actually did give a specific number. But uh, that's what's the kind of the undercurrent here, which shows a little bit more of the dysfunction in the interim. The first lady, on the, uh, on the other hand, I believe on Christmas Eve, went on to address the situation, too. And was She was asked a pretty hard question. America Congress is dragging its feet over granting more important dollars for the Ukrainian war effort. If that money doesn't come, what do you fear will happen? We do need aid desperately. In simple terms, 
Мы не можем Our life or death is depending on you, ergo it's your fault. Now, if you think that a message is falling on deaf ears, then you haven't listened very long to retired U.S. Army General Ben Hodges. No, two things. First of all, Ukraine has not failed. I think we in the West have failed. We, we failed to commit strategically to Ukraine winning, and therefore we have failed to deliver those capabilities that Ukraine needs and has expected that would enable the counteroffensive to be successful. Now, Matt, as I see it, there's there's two issues at play here, at least two we want to talk about today, based on the desire to get more troops and, and, and to mobilize more people. And, and it's implied in, in especially what the First Lady and in Hodges both said, that there's two options. There's either victory or there's death. That's it. There's no other option. Now, there's a difference between preferences They would prefer victory or death. We've actually heard that in our own history in the past. But it's a different story between are there alternatives? And I argue that there are. Now, there are two issues that we want to talk about. One is this one here. And then the second one, which almost nobody in the West wants to talk about. And that's the other half of this equation, the Russian side. We'll get to that in just a second. But first of all, on the U.S. side, I argue and wonder from your State Department experience, if you uh, have a, a different view, that there is another option. It's not victory or death. But victory, death, meaning keep fighting and ignore the reality, or negotiated settlement. Do you think that that is actually a valid path that could be selected? Well, it certainly is a valid path, Danny. I mean, whether it's a, a politically uh, a desirous path uh, for those in Washington, D.C. is another question. And we always have to remember, you know, in the order of precedence, right, in the sense of, uh, uh, of how warfare works, where you have a tactical level, then an operational level, and a strategic level. And over the top of all of that is the political level, because oftentimes we see throughout history, throughout nations, political decisions that are not the best strategic decisions. And I think we have seen that in the case of this war in Ukraine uh, writ large. I mean, this is that is that is the best way to explain uh, not just Uh, the war the last couple of years, uh, you know, as the war gets close to being the invasion was almost two years ago now. Uh, but overall, the entire strategy uh, towards Ukraine, towards Eastern Europe, uh, towards Europe as a whole, towards Russia by the U.S. over the last decades, uh, going back to the Cold War, has been a strategic uh, a, a folly. It's been diplomatic malpractice, but it's been, as those in power in the U.S. would see, good politics. So certainly, okay. yeah, okay. certainly, and actually, actually, maybe, and now this could just be a subset of that fourth category you talked about, or it might be its own category above that. Gary, let me throw you a quick curveball here. <laughs> you still have handy that uh, that uh, clip from uh, uh, Blinken talking about that the money one. Do you have that handy? Virtually all of the security assistance that we provided to Ukraine that gets invested right here in the United States. It builds our own defense industrial base. So. In many ways, this this is a win-win for us. Man, war is a win-win. I still can't get I it just I can't yeah. get my head wrapped around how openly and honestly he has said that. Wouldn't even talking about winning or losing or the strategic implications or the right or the moral. It's the cash. Right. And, and they're desperate. I mean, they're desperate in, in the sense that all the other arguments fall flat now. All the lies they have said don't no longer make sense. All their predictions of uh, easy, rosy victory. The, I mean, how many times have we heard that the Russians are running out of ammunition? How many times have we heard that the Russian troops are running away from their front lines? How close is it to a collapse of the Russian government or the, 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 the implosion of the Russian economy? Uh, you know, I mean, it, so all these other arguments don't make sense. The arguments that we are fighting for a democratic Ukraine, a, a just Ukraine, a Ukraine, a, a nation of human rights. You know, there's article after article in the mainstream press that, you know, destroys that argument. So they have fallen upon this argument that <clears throat> this is good for business. This is good for the American economy and not just Tony Blinken. And the, the, you the know, trouble the thing that is that I think that, that that does motivate some people. Some people go, okay. 
Yeah, a very, but the, the reality is, it, and certainly it motivate members of Congress because they want those campaign contributions from the weapons industry, from the merchants of death, uh, you know, as the Pope uh, calls them, as, as history has rightly called the weapons makers, the merchants of death. Uh, you know, so they want those campaign contributions. Uh, the defense industry is in full gear, making sure their people uh, are on uh, are in the media, that they're on television, that they're on the radio and on the podcast, et cetera, that they're in the Washington Post and in the New York Times. Uh, you know, and and so there is that small subset that is desirous for that that sees the advantage. But you know, as as most as as many people understand, you know, it's one very small segment of our economy that has been heavily yes. subsidized has been uh, disastrously invested in at the expense of other aspects of the American economy, the point that we now have a, a rather hollow economy that where, you know, the, the second largest export for the United States last year or was uh, weapons, was arms. We exported more weapons than we did agriculture. We had about $196 billion in agricultural exports last year and about $206 billion in, ag in weapons exports last year. I mean, so mo wow. and, and fossil I fuel top export. Yeah, most people don't realize that. You know, I mean, so when you look then, at that. But then, wait a minute, wait a minute. But then in terms of the overall economy, in terms of like the American economy, domestic economy and, and what sectors are, are, you know, contributing to it, the defense industry is only one small little spindle of it right i mean that's it's not exactly even, right. very it's small not commensurate with how much we send out ergo the focus in the big winners are the arms industry not the american economy and the, definitely not the american people right and in the weapons industry the arms industry these defense contractors lockheed boeing raytheon etc uh they provide relatively few jobs compared to almost all other industries so if you look at the work done by, say, UMass Amherst or by Brown University, I mean, people have looked at this, they've analyzed it, and they found that putting money into almost any other sector, any other industry produces more jobs than weapons. And you look at where we are in this country in the sense of what could we be investing in? What could we be putting our public funds in? Because also, to remember, uh, the Pentagon takes up about 55% of discretionary, uh, of discretionary uh, spending, of federal yeah. spending. Yeah. Right. I mean, so the opportunity costs here are vast, but this is where they're at, though, to get back to Ukraine, because we could talk about this, you know. Right. You know this right? could be. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, it, and we should, you know, but right. but the, the uh, um, getting back to Ukraine, this is the argument that that the, the uh, U.S. leadership has fallen upon uh, both Republicans and Democrats, that this money is well spent, that it provides jobs, that it's investing in a defense industrial base. Uh, you know, I mean, trying to make that argument because, all, again, all the other arguments for this war in Ukraine have been exposed, have fallen flat, just don't make sense any longer. And I mean, I think, too, people look at the state of the war uh, and they realize that what is this worth? What, what What is and, you know, the fears of Russia? I mean, you know, the arguments that if we don't stop Russia now, they're going to march into. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, it's I mean, Paris. It just makes Paris no sense. Gonna fall. It just makes no sense. I mean, oh, if no. that's really the case that they're going to they, they, in, in almost two years, they've conquered uh, roughly 10 percent of Ukraine because they had captured 10 percent before uh, the invasion. Yeah. They've only, right, right. Right. I mean, like they've only taken and, and that we're supposed to be afraid of this. And you keep telling us how how uh, how how bad off the Russian army is, how bad their morale yeah. is. Right. Well, how, they're going to go to they, Paris. Come on, yeah, man. Exactly, that's exactly right. So they have to settle on this argument. And I think when you go back and you look at, well, who are the people who are saying this? It's people whose legacies, whose futures are dramatically intertwined with the set success of this U.S. proxy war in Ukraine. Yeah. And, and, and the people you know, who and, are. And look, Matt, look, I, I'm, I'm all about a strong national defense. I've never shied from saying that. I, I'm not anti-war. I'm not pacifist in any way, shape or form. I'm all about the security and the defense of our country and having a strong economic or, or, or industrial capacity to maintain that, a strong, you know, a recruited effort, to training the troops and all that to defend our country. But in my view, this is perversely undermining that 
because we're diverting so much of our money into all these things for exports and whatever else that that, is, uh, that helps this one slim sector of the economy at the expense of the rest of it. And it's also undercutting our own capacity for national defense. Not only have we given a lot away to Ukraine, tons of it, now a bunch to, to Israel as well, but we're also spending money on things that are great for the defense contractors, the, the Boeings, the Lockheeds and all of them, and bad for actually sustaining a war if you do get uh, sucked into one, you know, if you do get thrust into one. Our capacity to wage war is less because of this, not more. And um, we see that, Danny. We see that happening in the sense that we have got in a whole, whole other show. We, we talked about it a bit, I think, last time I was on, or maybe two times ago, about why are we in Iraq and why are we in Syria? But, you know, certainly look at the attacks on uh, American forces just in the last 24 hours uh, in Iraq, uh, in in the Red Sea, off the coast yeah. of Yemen. Right. Um, and, you know, and what we now now see as well, we see the Japanese sending us their Patriot missile uh, systems, their, their interceptor missiles, uh, because we have given so many to the Ukrainians. And we actually have forces who are in combat, who are being attacked, who can utilize weapon systems like the Patriot, and That's we're running point. out of them. And the Japanese have to send us theirs. Now, the, the, why we're in Iraq, what's happening with Yemen, all, that's a whole other story. Again, yeah. and I would argue that, uh, argue that as a strategic mistake, a strategic disaster, uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, a, ye, decades of, again, diplomatic malpractice, strategic malpractice by the U.S. that have put us in this place, as well as legacies such as the, Brett McGurk has been running our show in the Middle East for two decades now, basically. And that guy's not going to give up his legacy, his desire. I mean, so the personal becomes very important in this. But the the what you're talking about, where we're putting ourselves in terms of being overextended, of not being able to uh, carry out just, I think, the basic task of defending our soldiers who have been put in these positions that we can argue about, and we will both yeah. argue that these positions are the wrong places for them to be. But if they are going to be there, they need to be able to defend themselves. And right. you know, so that what we've done here is just, just one, uh, uh, one, just I, I don't even want to call it a misstep because that implies some type of good faith, right? Uh, you know, it's but just an accident, I'm just an error. But yeah, exactly. Like we, 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 we walked into this with our best. Uh, uh, our best estimations that we really were, were approaching this with, you know, we really sat down and we thought about, no, this is just, just incompetence uh, and greed, uh, and you greed. know, right. Yeah. Megalomania. Blinded, blinded by yeah. greed. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So in the time we have left here, I don't want to, I want to get too far away from our primary topic here. Cause I do want to look at the second half of this uh, problem, which I think in Ukraine, which gets very little discussion, and that is the Russian side of this. This this idea that uh, okay, the the summer offensive failed, so all of 2023 uh, came to naught. Didn't you didn't get anything? Didn't change any hands. In fact, much of the the pieces of terrain that Ukraine scratched out during the summer offensive is now in danger of being lost, and they are losing several parts of it, and probably are going to a couple of major ones here, or relatively major here in, in the next uh, month or so. We'll see how that works out. But the Russian side is not sitting <laughs> passive or static. That's kind of the view. All this stuff failed. And so now then they want to go to 2024. They want to get another half million, which is basically an army. By the way, our United States Army in its entirety, less than half a million. You're now going to try to recruit, meaning of half a million, basically privates, because no one has any experience above that. You want to create a new army and have it be successful when all the previous iterations have failed, while the Russian side is stepping up its game. Putin is very much aware of this, and he is not blinded by the the, the spin that we keep putting on. And uh, just a few days ago, he said this. Сегодня Украина почти ничего уже не производит. Ну, пытаются что-то там еще сохранить. Но почти ничего не производит. Все привозят, извините за мовитон, ну, на халяву все привозят. Но эта халява когда-то может и закончиться. И, судя по всему, так и заканчивается. And instead of seeing things that either it's victory or death, as the Ukraine side was, was saying there, he sees a different option, which is a little bit uh, different than what they suggested. Мы достигнем своих целей, о которых вы сказали. Теперь вернемся к этим целям. Они не меняются. 
Вот э, я напомню, о чем мы тогда говорили. О денацификации Украины, о, э, о демилитаризации, о ее нейтральном статусе. Теперь, что касается демилитаризации, ну, не хотят э, договариваться, ну что ж, мы тогда вынуждены принимать другие, в том числе военные меры. Again, kind of a, uh, I think a subtle dig that was sit there for people who were paying attention is in his description of what the outcomes will be. He was saying uh, demilitarization, and then he said, or some other things, or neutral status. And for anyone who's not aware, that's the language that was issued back in March of 2022 in, in Istanbul, when this war could have been over at about the one month mark. Because a general outline of an agreement had received by both sides, negotiating partners when they left that meeting, and then it was sabotaged by any number of other Western people. We don't know who they are. Now that Putin is still saying your options are either now negotiate an end into neutral status, ergo, you can still there can still be Ukraine. I'm, I don't need to conquer the whole thing. I don't even want to. But we can do this. Or if you don't, if you continue fighting, we will too. They are now ramping up all of their military industrial capacity to full speed now. And they are cranking stuff off, especially in drones, artillery shells, all the things that we can't produce at industrial capacity. They are, their, their machine works are working. Their tank factories are back working again at high level. Uh, and, and they're mobilizing, not forced mobilization, but actually recruiting uh, up to 400,000 people this year. So they are getting stronger in every category while Ukraine is trying to field an army of privates and, and it has no domestic uh, industrial capacity to speak of that can sustain war. These two things are incompatible. They're incongruous. And if we don't do anything except shovel more cash, then we're going to be handing Ukraine to Russia, I think, Matt. Yeah. Um, and, and for people who scoff at the idea of neutrality, it, 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 it's, you know, Uh, it's remarkable how much the example of Austria is not brought up uh, in the U.S. We, we talk a lot about Germany after the Second World War, about the establishment of the Iron Curtain, about the establishment of NATO and the Warsaw Pact. But we, we, we rarely ever talk about uh, the success of the neutrality of Austria. And Austria was occupied after the Second World War. Uh, by both sides, by both the, the Western side, the Allies, and then by the, the Soviet side. And in 1955, at, after a proposal put forward by the Soviets for neutrality of Austria, uh, Austria was no longer occupied. Uh, everyone went home. And Austria maintained that neutrality throughout the Cold War and, and, and still maintains it to a degree today. And I mean, it's a success that doesn't get spoken about because it, it goes against the narrative, right? It goes against this grain that there has to be an us versus them and that and that know, we have to win. We have to win. And yeah, if they're not on our else. side, then they are against us. And that, you know, and it's I mean, so there are examples where this has been dramatic examples where where such a, a, a neutral state has been proven successful. And can you imagine Germany never, they never got to that point with Germany. I'll argue that had a lot to do with the Americans and the British, but an idea of a neutral Germany say, can you imagine what history would have become if you had a neutral Germany and a neutral Austria serving as yeah. buffers between, between the West the and the East, right? I mean, and so yeah. that's what, that's what I think what, what the, what the desire wow. is on the Russian side. Uh, Putin's goals, whether he'll see a denazification, uh, I would argue that Uh, his invasion has backfired. If, if anyone politically is in a better place in Ukraine right now, it is the, quote, Nazis, unquote. It is the far right, the ultranationalists, uh, the demilitarization as well. Yeah, they've killed a lot of people. But the idea, though, behind the remilitarization of Ukraine, as we read about when we see the fact that American bankers from BlackRock and State Street and other places are heading over to Ukraine, right? I mean, so the Goldman Sachs is basically going to own Ukraine when this thing is over, right. it, you know, as well as what the Ukrainian government says. What And Gary put up that photo of, of Zelensky with all the American weapons contractors. The, the idea. Well, yeah, all those big right? smiles, man. Yeah, the idea really is that, Christmas came early. Yeah, the idea is that, okay, maybe it, maybe Ukraine is, is in a bad spot right now, but You know, if our strategy of hope carries forward and the, there's not a collapse in a few years time, we will have a, a militarized Ukraine. It will be a Sparta 
uh, to defend the West versus, versus Russia and its hordes. You know, I mean, so that's the thinking that goes behind this. And, you know, I mean, could you get to a point where you have a neutral Ukraine? Absolutely. Could it be demilitarized to a point where there is not that industry that they're talking about, that they're dreaming about? This idea that uh, Zelensky himself has said that Ukraine will be the arms factory for the democratic nations of the world. I mean, so there are these, you know, so when Putin talks about achieving his goals, you know, that's what that's what we're up against here in terms of seeing a negotiated settlement. I mean, Putin's goal of, 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 of achieving a buffer zone of a limited, limited territorial conquest has occurred. And, and I, I don't see how without the introduction of a NATO army into Ukraine, and I mean, like an army in the truest sense of of, you know, yeah. five core of mechanized infantry and armor uh, units, air uh, force, air defense, exactly, Navy, all right, that. exactly. Yeah. So, so World War Three, essentially, without that, you're not removing the Russian army from eastern Ukraine from those four oblasts or four provinces that the Russians have now annexed, uh, right? Not just, uh, yeah. not just, you know, Matt, that, that's one of the things that I, that I it just, it just grates my teeth when I hear people talk about, okay, sure. All of this this summer offensive completely and utterly failed, and we suffered massive casualties. But we're going to bring another half million privates. I'll keep repeating that into the <laughs> army, and we'll give it another go in 2024. But we still don't. You can't build an air force from scratch under fire after two years of war and have it work. Where are the air defense missiles going to come from when you see we're having to borrow from our own allies for a handful of troops in the Middle East? Where do you think you're going to get from those? And because, by the way, Russia is producing them in mass quantities now. They're starting to do that. There is no basis upon which you can even hope that you're going to be able to maintain yourself and not be even uh, lose even more. And that no one even wants to talk about those fundamental realities of building combat power. Just getting a bunch of dudes in uniforms that don't even hardly know what they're doing and don't have any experience is not going to win. Right. And it may it may be enough to maintain your lines. Right. It may be enough to maintain. Maybe, your lines. And, but it may Russian, not be in the rush. It, right, it may not be. It certainly is not enough to launch an offensive that's going to break through uh, the Russia's Russia's, uh, you know, defense in depth, uh, you know, and reach the Black Sea coast and all these other fantasies that people like Ben Hodges, who we heard from earlier, you know, were, 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 were speaking of not very long ago. And they'll speak about it again. We will hear that. Very soon, I think in the next couple of months, we'll hear again about the next Ukrainian offensive. I think what should be what should be noted is that the Russians themselves have not launched a major offensive. Yes, they're on the they're, they're, they're they are pressing forward multiple locations yeah, on the, the front, right? Yeah. But it's it's they're not launching the type of offensive I, I think people would expect. You know, after this failed Ukrainian counteroffensive of the summer. The fact that Ukrainian stocks are so low, their forces are depleted, they're exhausted. Uh, you know, Russia has proved that it's able to have supremacy in the air and other things. And as well, importantly, you've had what's occurring in Gaza. So attention has been diverted, particularly in, in American attention. And the U.S. simply cannot give as much to Ukraine as it could. So the fact that the Russians themselves had not launched a major offensive in these last couple months, and they may have to do with, you know, there's, there's issues with weather and things like that. But, you know, I mean, the fact that they haven't done it. And meanwhile, reports are that they have just actually been reinforcing their yes. defenses. Right. So I think that they are happy where they're at. They're happy with how they're fighting the war. They view this as their way to victory. It goes back to Putin's idea of demilitarization. We're just going to wear them down. Yeah. The war There's in Russia. Yeah. War in Russia is still popular. I mean, it's still about 70 percent support for the war, even higher support for, for Vladimir Putin. I mean, he's got an election coming up. Uh, so he doesn't want to do anything to jeopardize that political support that that. Yeah. You're right. Way, I, mean, I can't help but mention here that uh, Putin is going to stand for election here in, in I think, March it is, yeah. whatever. But the Democratic Ukrainian has said, yeah, we're not we can't have an election during a war. So we're just going to keep going, even right. though that's not there's no constitutional provision for that. But anyway, we'll leave that for another day. and We'll have to we'll have to pick that back up. Uh, and lots of things we can keep going on, Matt. Always look forward to having you come back to the next one here. These are great conversations. Uh, and we thank you very much for coming. And, and again, I hope you had a, a good uh, holiday and hope you have a good New Year's well. Yeah, thanks, Danny. Happy New Year to you and to everyone uh, watching and listening. Thanks. Thanks to you. And uh, we wish you all that uh, that same uh, 
uh, New Year's uh, wish as well, and, and hope you guys have a, have a good one. We will see you on the next episode of Deep Dive. As a matter of fact, you can come back uh, at 11 a.m. today. We have the uh, the excellent Chaz Freeman, Ambassador Freeman, is going to be on, and we're going to be talking about that other little conflict going on over there. You won't want to miss it. Uh, we are unintimidated and uncompromised to give you the information you need to make sense of your world, and we will see you on the next episode of Deep Dive.